Welcome everyone. This is Debbie Mayberry with National Kitchen and Bath Association. Uh, you are here for our third webinar of the month on storage design solutions. And today's session is called From the Root Cellar to the Amazon Room Storage and Organization Trends. And I also want to give a shout out to HEDIC for their generous sponsorship for all of our webinars for the month of October. Today, we have Christy Hansen, Janine Yancey, and also Michelle Gross with us, and they will tell you all about themselves. And ladies, we are ready to get started. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, and thank you to our sponsor today, HEDIC. We really appreciate the support for this webinar. My name is Christy Hodson, and I am the Senior Manager of Customer Strategy for CabinetWorks Group. In my role, I work with kitchen designers all over the country, and I keep an eye on data and consumer behavior and how this impacts the kitchen and bath industry. I've spent 15 years in the industry, and I have a passion for kitchen storage and organization and accessories. Hi, my name is Michelle Gross. I am a certified professional organizer and co-owner of All Sorted Out Professional Organizing. Um, my business partner, Carrie Harrison, and I have been in business for about seven years. Uh, we have a heart for helping people regain and reorder their space, both physical and mental. And I am Janine Yancey. I'm a kitchen and bath designer at KSI in Brighton, Michigan. Um, I've uh, been doing kitchen and bath design for 12 years and I really love it and I also have a passion for organ organized spaces. This is Christy again. The three of us met and we combined forces when we co-hosted a presentation for our local Michigan State and KBA chapter and um, out of that this presentation was born. So our learning objectives today are to understand how food storage needs have changed throughout history, to understand how macro trends in economics and consumer buying behavior have impacted storage needs in the kitchen, understand influencers in driving consumer interest levels and organizing solutions for kitchen and bath, and to preview up and coming storage and organization trends and learn how to stay on the leading edge. Throughout this presentation, you will hear from all three of us with each of us taking a focus on particular topics. So first we will turn it over to Michelle to discuss storage and organization through the years. Hi, it's Michelle. Um, and yeah, this is a fascinating topic. I had a wonderful time researching it and finding out all of these things I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, so in ancient times, there were few options for being able to eat food. You either had to find it or kill it. So hence, we have the hunter-gatherer era. Uh, and up until about 10,000 BC, this was the main source of food. Around that time, there was a transition from hunter-gatherer to settled agriculture. Um, and so throughout the ages, different cultures have discovered and created new techniques for farming and agriculture. Somewhere around the 17th century, there was a second agricultural revolution that we all know is our kind of our modern and our productive system. And then somewhere between the 1930s and the 1960s, there was a third agricultural revolution. And this resulted in an increase in agricultural production, especially in the developing world. Um, during the 19th century, shopping was mainly done at over-the-counter grocery shops like a mercantile or dry goods or a general store. If you kind of think of Little House on the Prairie mercantile, that was the sort of setting that you could shop in. Um, customers were completely dependent on the merchant to be honest in both their measurements and their pricing as none of the items were marked with a price tag. And then in the early, early 20th century, specifically in 1916, this reveals the grand opening of the very first US supermarket the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> They're still in business today. Uh, and this is the first self-service grocery store and the first appearance of the price tag. So it's relatively recent history. Uh, in 1933, Fred Meyer moves and he introduces a hypermarket. They had had a small store and they grew into a bigger store. And then they combined a supermarket and a department store all in one. 
Um, moving into modern times, we talk about food delivery. Um, food delivery is not a new concept. Our ancestors needed to have ice delivered and delivered to their ice boxes. That was the only way to keep food cold. Uh, and our grandparents still had milk and eggs delivered to their porch by the milkman. Um, with the invention of the home computer, this paved the way for grocery delivery. Um, the first appearance of grocery delivery is in 1997 and really begins to explode in about 2001. Present day sees us getting food from a variety of different sources, including the old fashioned trip to the grocery and or getting groceries delivered. And then there's also an uptick in locally grown food. You might go to your town's farmer's market or even growing your own garden in your backyard. So going back to the agricultural revolution in the 17th century, they would have used a root cellar, uh, not to be mistaken for a hobbit house, which I know it kind of looks like that. Um, this is the first organized way of storing food, the food that was grown. It's a cool, dark, usually underground hollow that slowed the aging process of food. So even in modern houses, there was usually an area in the basement reserved for storing or even prepping food. Uh, my grandparents had a fruit cellar in the basement and it was under the steps and it held the harvest from their backyard. They were very agricultural people. And uh, I know a couple of teenagers, namely my mom and my dad's sister who decided that it was okay to get into the wine store from the grapes in the backyard. So uh, they definitely got in trouble there, but it, it held the harvest from the, actually their backyard, their homegrown food. So on to how food storage and organization has evolved over the decades. So we're going to start in the beginning of the 19th century, when usually women would be cooking over an open fire or a brick oven. Now, cast iron stoves had been around for a while, but in 1795, the first regulatable gas stove comes onto the scene. Although it wasn't until about 1834 that they came to the market for home use. Now, this was a huge improvement to just building a fire then sticking your hand in to see if the temperature is correct. I far prefer the regulatable gas stove. <laughs> um, it started coming into homes, but it wasn't until after gas has had the ability to be piped into homes, which is right around the 1840s. So it really coincides with the gas stove hitting the kitchens, um, home kitchen. Gas is all the rage. It's a much cleaner way to light, cook and heat homes. Uh, most kitchens in that area era are very utilitarian. They have a freestanding workspace and table, a stove, and then what food or staples are stored in the kitchen are kept on open, open shelving. Open shelving. That sounds a little familiar. A freestanding workspace. That uh, sounds like an island to me. <laughs> so uh, we'll kind of see how that looks in the future from the 1800s. 1810 saw the invention of canning food in unbreakable tin containers, although the glass containers with those attached wires and lids, sometimes you can find those at garage sales, those were still used in the Civil War in 1861 to 1865. Campbell's was founded in 1860s. Uh, the first commercial canning business or canning company was began in 1912 in the U.S. Absolutely revolutionizing the food preservation business. Um, you know, preventing food poisoning. That was the biggest. There was just a huge factor back in that day. Um, around 1850, you'll notice that there's a book published by the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Her name is Catherine Beecher called the American Women's Home. And they set up guidelines about how to clean your house and your area, your yard, your, rear your children, use your time well, even set up your kitchen. The book was so also was so very popular and it worked really to shift women's thinking about how their homes are supposed to be set up and function. So this also sounds familiar to me in that there are, uh, books today that kind of teach us the same thing. Mm -hmm. And Chrissy was telling me about, or no, someone was telling me about how the, the book is available it online. It is. Um, you can actually search the American Woman's Home on Google and Google Books makes it available for free. And so you can take a little dive back and look at um, you know, how women were learning to run a household in the 1800s. 
And this goes through everything from, you know, how you should organize your week and what tasks you should do when. And um, it talks about uh, raising children and, um, and cooking and how to, how to um, cook for your family. And it really reminded me of some of the things we see today on, you know, like guidelines of, uh, you know, how often to clean your home and like um, tips, you know, you'll see all over Pinterest, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, like how to meal plan and, uh, and how, how to organize your week. Um, there's a very a strong connection between that history and what we're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, we coming into the 1850s, after several ineffective models, we're going to move on to some more kitchen appliances. Uh, after several ineffective models were developed by others, Josephine Cochran designs the first effective dishwasher. So she's a wealthy woman. She entertained often. She wanted a machine that could wash dishes faster than her servants could and without breaking them. So she received a patent in 1886, took it to the World's Fair in 1893, but really only hotels and restaurants took an interest. It wasn't until actually a hundred years later that in the 1950s that the dishwasher becomes a staple appliance in the kitchen. Uh, 1882 sees Edison build his first power plant in New York City, so this in turn paves the way for the first electric stoves to come into use in 1892. Uh, Indoor plumbing is also becoming more popular in 1899, so this makes the way for indoor sinks or kitchen sinks with running water, also revolutionary. So as we come next into the uh, 1900s, so right around 1900 to about 1920, this is a, these are some pictures of kind of what the freestanding activity in the kitchen kind of looks like. Um, but right around 1900, there is a great invention called the Hoosier cabinet. It enjoys immense popularity. This is an all-in-one cabinet. You can kind of put all your stuff away. It holds all the necessary parts of cooking into one place. So while it's convenient, It's soon to be overshadowed by the fitted kitchen coming into new homes. Those are all the built-ins right around, right after World War I. These kitchens start to, the house, new houses are being built, um, built in cabinets, countertops, running water. Uh, By 1935, the Hoosier cabinet is considered old fashioned. Now, I know many people these days who would pay an extraordinary amount of money to actually be able to find an intact Hoosier cabinet to put into their 100-year-old farmhouse to keep it uh, kind of era true. Um, but we, or they could have a, you know, they talk about maybe having a similar version built into their kitchen. So Janine's going to touch on that a little bit later as a coming trend. Um, the two world wars, they bring about change in the focus of the family. Uh, there's a push to grow and store your food for your family as a way to make and further the war effort and also as a protection against a break in the food chain. Uh, women band together. They make jelly, they can vegetables. You can see that during a time of impending doom, families are encouraged to stock up on food in case of disaster with a modified food root cellar sort of system uh, back in the day. Although it is a little reminiscent of the times today as well. Uh, In 1925, electricity is in about only half of American homes, but this makes having a refrigerator, which comes to the market in 1930, a possibility if you can afford it, because Americans are also suffering from the effects of the Great Depression at this point. Uh, In 1935, a New Deal stimulus is delivered to the American people also sounds familiar, and it enables them to afford some luxuries like a refrigerator or a car to be able to go to the grocery store. Um, And just preserving your food, having a refrigerator to preserve your food, it just, you can't waste a scrap of food in that day. Um, So this is just becomes a very important, excuse me, innovation. Around this time also the national grid is created and it standardizes the stream of consistent electricity to power these appliances. Changes the American kitchen forever. Um, TVs become a household fixture in the 50s, giving businesses a way to get their product in front of consumers through advertising. Tupperware is invented in 1942, also really great food storage 
um, method and it, the innovative party method of selling explodes as a way for women who needed or wanted to work to make their own hours. Um, more and more women enter the workforce by the, the 1970s, uh, making more and more kitchen conveniences necessary uh, and marketable actually. Uh, the microwave is discovered in 1946, but the machine itself doesn't become popular until 1977, when people realize that they are not actually going to be radiated in their homes. <laughs> so that was a big fear back in the day. Uh, crock pots are invented in the 1940s. Uh, by 1975, the popularity of the crock pot or slow cooker increased and is advertised to the working women as a convenient tool for cutting time in the kitchen. Uh, the 60s and 70s see that there's a renewed interest in home cooking. This is my new favorite word is fetishizing kitchen utensils um, and entertaining, which means that the kitchen is quickly becoming the hub for social activity. By the 1980s, the idea of a completely open kitchen with appliances designed to show off that came into being and the trophy kitchen was born. Uh, so welcome now to the 21st century, where reality entertainment is king. There are programs that will show the process from mess to success in, in, in the organizing industry in about a 27 minute time frame. Uh, trading spaces was one of the first ones, tidying up the home edit. Those are just a few of the more popular ones and more recent ones actually that have come out. Um, internet browsing and internet shopping has also become a staple in our way of life these days. Um, although invented in 1996, the year 1990 or 1998 sees Amazon take a huge jump in online orders and deliveries. As we all know, Amazon carries just about everything and will deliver such. More about that later too. Social media also plays a very large role in presenting a bigger, better, more organized approach to life. Uh, and books like The Magic Art of Tidying Up in the Home Edit are busy shaping people's ideas, uh, as well as Pinterest and Facebook and a whole bunch of articles and blogs and, and oh my goodness, Instagram, you name it, it is out there. You can find whatever you need for your type of area to be able to organize. And it's shaping people's ideas about what is, what is the perfect kitchen, the perfect home, the perfect life. Uh, you know, smart appliances are gaining popularity. Uh, we can touch our phones and take an inventory of what's in the refrigerator and see what we need to buy actually while we are at the store. So the innovations abound for sure. Um, so the next uh, area that we're going to cover, Christy's going to cover for you. Hi, this is Christy, and I'm going to take you through some data and trends that are currently happening in organization and consumer behavior. So we had the view of the past and everything that's brought us to this point and how we've kind of evolved along the way. And now we'll take a look at a zoom into consumers homes today and a little bit of um, data and what's happening. So first of all, for years, Consumers have had a love affair with open concept floor plans. I know all of you have heard this term over and over. Homes with fewer blocked off rooms and more room to entertain have been the request of many people shopping for homes. Thanks to this open floor plan obsession, along with remodeling TV shows, like you mentioned, Michelle, um, designers have reported for the past several years that their customers have been asking to take down a wall and open the space up. Does this sound familiar to any of you? I'm sure it does. Um, all of this openness means that there are clear sight lines throughout the main floor and the clutter on your kitchen countertop isn't out of sight, out of mind when you're done preparing a meal. While this trend has been strong toward open concept for many years, Families stuck at home during the pandemic have begun rethinking this. So this is actually a trend that's at an interesting pivot point. Um, quiet spaces to work from home with privacy, places for children to do schoolwork and Zoom lessons all become difficult when everybody is in the same room. Um, so an interesting figure here, 92% of designers say that their clients want kitchens to be one big space that includes living and dining areas. And this is from a study by Ricky. If you're not familiar with Ricky, they are the Research Institute for Cooking and Kitchen Intelligence. 
And they're basically this, this organization that um, goes out and talks to designers, talks to consumers, um, gets data, tons of surveys out there, and they bring it back, uh, bring it back to us and um, help us filter through and understand what's happening and what we can do about it in the kitchen and bath industry. So um, love some of the data that they share with us. According to a Ricky report on four generations in the kitchen, the number one reason that consumers made changes to their kitchen in the past 12 months is because they wanted it organized better. Notice I didn't say they wanted a full scale kitchen remodel, but this is they wanted to make a change in their kitchen. So that's the first step. Um, Gen Z and millennials were even more likely than Gen X and baby boomers to cite this reason. So the, these younger consumers coming into the marketplace are becoming more and more motivated by organization. And, um, you know, in each of your businesses, you should think about connecting with that group of consumers and providing organizing solutions could be one way to do that. Storage space is a kitchen priority. When Ricky, again, that's the Research Institute for Cooking and Kitchen Intelligence. This is one of their studies in 2020. When they asked consumers what would be the most important thing to have in their new kitchen, the number one answer representing 49% of consumers was lots of storage space. <laughs> also related, the runner up was a walk-in pantry with 41%. So number one and number two both relate to having enough storage space to store your things in your kitchen. These two features even ranked more important than an island, which is pretty hard to believe. You'd mm -hmm. think that the island is um, something that um, is kind of that holy grail of what every consumer wants in their kitchen, but storage space is even more important. Open shelving is expected to stay strong as well, which is funny. You know, it, it was strong in the 1800s um, when uh, Catherine Beecher put the um, American Woman's Home together and gave examples of um, how to set up an effective kitchen. Um, today, we do it more a little bit for the design aesthetic than the sheer necessity, but um, open shelving is expected to stay strong. 82% of designers predict that levels will stay the same or even increase over the next year, according to um, Ricky's study from Designers, Designers Talk Trends. While things are out invisible, um, it does become even more important to have a strategy for keeping them organized. So it doesn't just end up with, you see everything all over these it's shelves a, that are It's a delicate balance. Yes. Sure. <laughs> it's a delicate balance. <laughs> We have also seen um, a lot of time at home recently. The pandemic has changed quite a bit for all of us. It's no surprise that Americans have spent more time at home this year. 55% of households report that they are cooking and eating more at home, according to a John Burns real estate consulting survey published last month. Um, and this time at home, especially with more time in your kitchen, means that consumers are reminded daily about the things they don't like about their kitchens and how they're organized. Um, a lot of time in that space um, bubbles up some of those um, things that you're not happy about. 75% uh, of consumers, according to a Good Eggs delivery service survey, said that their eating and cooking habits have changed since the pandemic began. Again, no surprise there. Um, from this group, 46% say that they're cooking much more, 29% say that they're doing more meal planning, and 22% say that they're doing more bulk cooking. So all of these changes are great opportunities for you, the kitchen and bath expert, to step in and provide help. A separate study by John Burns Real Estate Consulting found that 30% of households are buying and storing more supplies in bulk. If you haven't already, you should be asking your customers about their bulk buying habits and designing clever storage for these purposes. Yes. Um, those types of purchases are not something that you can just store easily in a wall cabinet in a kitchen. Mm -hmm. You might need to think about the depth needed. You mm -hmm. might need to think about um, storing some things adjacent to the kitchen um, for, for bulk items. That could be, you know, your large supply of paper towels, but it could also be large supplies of food in bulk as well. 
While consumer frequency of buying groceries has not been impacted by COVID-19, the survey shows that other grocery shop shopping habits have been. Since March 2020, 68% of respondents have bought groceries online for delivery, with 43% buying groceries online for delivery two or more times each month. After the pandemic is over, 81% of those who have ordered groceries online for delivery say they will continue to do so. So even when it's safer to be out in public and out in grocery stores, we've found that it's very convenient and we like the time that it gives us back in our week when we can order online for delivery and have those um, safely and securely delivered right to us. Um, another thing that I like to think about is all these types of deliveries growing in popularity also allow independence for people that might not be able to get out to the grocery store, whether that is um, a senior that might not have a lot of mobility, whether that is someone that has a disability um, and doesn't have the ability to go out and shop in a grocery store. This allows you to maintain independence, which I love. So remember the ordering process has changed with technology, but this is not the first time grocery delivery has been popular. Um, do any of you remember milk shoots, that photo on the right? They were small doors built into a home that allowed delivery of fresh milk to a home. And Michelle, mm -hmm. you alluded to this earlier with those egg deliveries, milk deliveries. Yeah, and sometimes these one, the milk shoots themselves, so it has a door on the outside and a door on the inside. Uh, the older homes would have them. Sometimes they were then lined with um, steel so that it would help to keep it to insulate and keep things uh, cooler. Uh, the other bonus about that is that if you locked yourself out of your house, the <laughs> smallest kid could fit through the milk chute to unlock the door. I speak from, ex clearly I speak from a little bit of experience. <laughs> I personally love the milk chute in my great grandparents home oh, in yeah. the uh, you know Metro Detroit area um, a fond memory but it's kind of neat to revisit that with some of the grocery delivery that we're doing now the global pandemic has left many people feeling a loss of control due to unemployment health uncertainty worry about family members and also stay-at-home orders while it's certainly no replacement for peace of mind and security, many people turn to organizing and managing their homes as a coping technique or a distraction strategy. As Rhonda Kaysen, the author of New York Times' Write at Home, How to Buy, Decorate, Organize, and Maintain Your Space, again, that feels very much like what we uh, heard from Catherine Beecher. Um, as she put it, speaking about TV shows about organizing, she said, um, the rise of these shows has happened in the last four years during a tumultuous time that's unsettling for people. They're wrestling for control over their possessions and their life when they don't have much control over anything. Definitely relatable, mm -hmm. which of course leads me to home organizing entertainment has reached new heights in recent years. Marie Kondo's book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, as well as her 2019 Netflix series, had people all over the country asking themselves which of their possessions spark joy. New and upcoming on the scene is a duo from Nashville, Clea and Joanna. They're an organizing team with a company called The Home Edit. Their books have reached Amazon bestseller lists and their Netflix series that debuted in September shot up the charts and has consumers standing in line outside the container store waiting to, to buy all these different containers to organize their homes. So keep an eye on them if you haven't seen them already. They have a great social media presence as well. One way to measure interest over time is through Google Trends. So if you look at searches for the term pantry organization, this goes back um, all of the history that Google has here. It's remained relatively steady throughout the past 16 years of search interest history, but you can see in the past two to three years, these interest levels begin to climb. And if we zoom way in and look at just the past 12 months, we can see peaks by week in interest. I like to look at these charts kind of in the context of what's happening at the moment. So it's no surprise that New Year's resolutions are a bump in pantry organization each and every year. 
This year, we saw two additional spikes in March and in April during the beginning of those stay at home orders in several states. And then finally in September, which just happened to be the month that the home edit debuted on Netflix. So if you are a kitchen and bath dealer, you can use this type of information to plan your marketing efforts for the biggest impact for your dollar. So if you know that consumers are likely to search for home organization and pantry organization, maybe you use some of those keywords in your paid digital advertising um, to get the most interest and the most eyes on your, on your products. Or just in case you needed some extra homework, <laughs> you could also just take a look at what the, these programs and the books are saying, uh, because that is what people are then bouncing from mm -hmm. uh, and do just do some research. And just uh, that's, that's kind of where we went with the professional organizing. I watched it specifically to see what's being put out there in front of people. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's fun research. It's fun. It's very fun. <laughs> yeah. fun homework. Nerd alert here. Um, <laughs> over the, of course, we must mention the social media and the role it plays. We were just talking through that a little bit, um, but it really drives interest in storage and organization. Over 400,000 images on Instagram use the hashtag pantry. Pantry organization and pantry goals are other popular hashtags. Um, Pinterest is full of resources from how to create the perfectly organized pantry to um, putting little labels on all of your spices, exactly the same font. Um, we've been, you know, we, we've really become used to, and we almost take it for granted these days that, you know, we get to peek into the homes and into the kitchens and into the closets of our friends, uh, you know, almost on a daily basis um, and even strangers through photos that are shared on social media. If you spend any time on Pinterest, you are no stranger to all of the specialty cooking devices that are popular today. So recipes using instant pots, slow cookers, air fryers are just becoming more and more popular. And what, what we need to think about as kitchen and bath designers is all of these devices take space. So think about storage when you work with your consumers. Um, maybe use deep drawers, pantries with sturdy rollout trays, um, even walk-in pantries or walk-through pantries. Those are great ways to store all of those specialty cooking devices. And lastly, specialty refrigeration is also on the rise. No longer is one refrigerator enough storage space for our cold foods. Um, but consumers today want at least one refrigerator for the kitchen, along with an auxiliary full-size refrigerator in the basement or the garage. Maybe that's and for beverages. Or. And yes, or. and or. <laughs> <laughs> and then increasingly, we see separate columns for refrigerators and freezers. Um, we see separate drawer refrigerated storage space, and then specialty storage for wine or even um, kids' snacks. When you're designing, don't just assume that a single refrigerator will cover all of the cold food storage needs for your customer and have a conversation. Um, you know, start by asking how many refrigerators you have <laughs> or where they'd like to, to store cold foods and what type of needs they have. So that brings us through all of the current trends in storage and organization. And now I will turn it over to Janine for a fun and exciting look at what's on the horizon in kitchen and organization trends in the future. All right, so first we're gonna start with the zero waste kitchen. Um, we, and most of these trending topics we have seen a lot on social media. Um, so that's why we chose them um, because we just see that that is something that's popular and we see a lot of posts about. Uh, the zero waste kitchen is about reducing your like carbon footprint and reducing landfill waste. Um, so you want to, you're going to need storage space for that. You want to have reusable items. Even, um, you can see here, uh, you want to have even your paper towel. You don't want to have paper products. You don't want to have plastic products. You want to use metal and glass and, um, wood items. Um, I looked on, uh, there's a website called sustainablejungle.com. And they gave a few recommendations on how to have a zero waste kitchen. 
Um, they recommend buying in bulk so you can shop from your own pantry. So you would definitely need to have a dedicated pantry space as we show in a lot of the pictures previously. Um, and uh, when buying in bulk, you wanna buy products that sell in reusable uh, or compostable packaging. Reusable storage, as I said, is a big, big um, key item in this type of kitchen um, so that you can clean it, you can reuse it, whether you hand wash it or put it in the dishwasher, you don't want it to be something that you just use once and throw away. And this is also true, not just for storage items, but for cleaning items, um, what you, how you buy things. So even wherever you shop, you want to dedicate to a company that uses uh, reusable materials or zero waste items. I'm very, very conscious about that. Uh, meal prepping is popular so that your, you know, eating out is not very zero waste. <laughs> There's a lot of waste if you eat out. So prepping your meals ahead of time and being able to take your meals with you is a, a good feature in this type of kitchen or lifestyle. Um, and then with food scraps, you even want to try to reduce your waste with that. So they say to um, have a second use for any sort of scraps. And if you can't reuse it for something else, whether in your garden or anything, then compost it. Um, and that's not just food. Um, there are paper products or other um, types of items that can also be composted. Um, and then in reference to design, they talk about keeping the design minimal. Um, so that, and mostly what they're referring to there is not having specialty appliances. Use your main appliances, you know, your big, your fridge and your stove, um, but don't get the crock pot, don't get the um, quesadilla and panini maker, and don't get the specialty fruit core and peeler and slicer. Um, you just want to have the items that you need and not be wasteful on that. And if you think about it, that's a very similar life to these kitchens that we saw from the past. Mm -hmm. When I look at the example that you have up here on this slide, um, showing all those different spices and the bulk ingredients, yeah. that looks like a Hoosier it's cabinet. A Hoosier cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just like, it, it, this is not something that's new, but it's like, it's rediscovered yeah. for this generation. Uh, you just, just have a different twist on something. It's trends are, are very cyclical. And I would think this would lend to having, you could have the cute little glass jars with all the labels that match and constantly fill them. Um, that would work really well for that type of lifestyle. Um, next, we're going to get into a trend that we heard about uh, is called having an Amazon room. This is not just because the idea of getting your groceries or anything delivered to your house from Amazon, um, not only would you just have it delivered to your front porch, but you could have a dedicated room just for delivered items to go into. So, um, and especially if you do groceries, you'd want it to be locked or have a keypad. You'd want it to be insulated and temperature controlled um, and have good storage in there. Um, Amazon even has a page that talks about, you can customize your delivery experience. Um, they call it, they had a couple of topics called room of choice, or inside your entryway or front porch. So you could tell Amazon where you want your stuff delivered. You can have them give them access like it shows here with a code or something to have them put delivery items into your home or a dedicated room um, or room of choice. Even if you, have, if you have a dedicated room, whether it's off of your porch or in your garage, if you don't have that, they'll even, it says room of choice, they'll deliver into whatever room you ask for and they're willing to go up a maximum of two flights of stairs. And like Christy referred to earlier, this is really great for, it's a very um, accessible um, living in place type of service where anybody can have home delivery service no matter what your um, situation is, seniors or handicapped or anything like that. And we were talking earlier that this would even be great for Christmas time. I, I like to order all my Christmas presents um, online and have them delivered to my house so I don't have to take time to go shopping. And it would be so awesome to have a dedicated room for them to deliver all those boxes into and lock it so the kids can't find it and it's not taking up space in my closet. Um, that I, would be awesome, but I, I probably wouldn't dedicate money to that. <laughs> but it's a really 
I like the idea for sure. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, have any of your customers um, started asking for an Amazon room? Have you designed any special spaces for deliveries? Oh, awesome. Pop yes. it in the chat box or a question. We'd love to take questions at the end of this as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so on to the, the next item or lifestyle trend that we're seeing is minimalism or a minimalist stock lifestyle. Um, and some of this overlaps with um, the zero waste lifestyle and I'll get into that. But um, so this is more about just having what you need, nothing extra, um, you, it's very zero waste and minimalism are a little anti-consumerism lifestyle. Um, minimalism. Uh, so I went on to becomingminimalist.com and they also had some uh, bullet pointed tips for having a minimalist kitchen. Um, they said no extras or they are also like the zero waste are against having specialty appliances. Um, they said no mixer, no bread maker, um, no specialty gadgets. You just, you know, you can use your oven as your, your oven, your toaster, your microwave to reheat things. You don't want to have extra things out on the countertop. Um, they even said, you know, don't have a toaster, don't have a knife block, put things in your drawers and get them out of that visual space. Um, no special occasion dishes. You just have, um, they had like even numbered rules, have eight plates, eight glasses and eight bowls. That's all you need, because typically they said you don't have more than eight people over at a time, usually. Um, and they said, like, and if you have more than eight people, then overlap. Use your coffee mugs and your glasses. It's not about looking pretty. It's about having only what you need and not having anything extra. Um, they said, don't so don't have that specialty china that you got from your wedding. Just have the dedicated items that you need. And then they even said, um, for pots and pans, you need three pots and three pans, and that's it. So the I think the difference of minimalism versus zero waste is you don't need as much storage. That would really lend to the open concept design. You could have a few open shelves and just some base cabinets, and you have things in certain places, and it doesn't need to take up tons and tons of space because you're just very conscious about what you have and you don't need to go out and buy more all the time. Um, this minimalism is also really popular in closet spaces. Um, Christy had a good picture of a closet earlier and they give a rule on having only 33 pieces of clothing. There's a, was it a, a book or a website called Project 33 or a capsule wardrobe and they'll give you advice on how to reduce your wardrobe and make it flexible so that you can mix and match different pieces to work for different types of occasions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really interesting way of life. And then the last one is multi-purpose. Um, so this is more of the spaces in your home. Um, I think all of us have multi-purpose spaces in the home, whether we realize it or not. Um, a lot of times the laundry room can double as uh, a mudroom foyer entryway. You might, like it shows here, have a dog station in there for food and washing the dog. Um, it could be storage and kind of coincide with the garage. Um, in the kitchen, we show here a little desk space. So you might, your kitchen or your dining room, especially today, might double as an office space or a school space and you need the cabinetry or the spaces to um, change from different times of day or different days in the week to function in different ways. So you can use cabinetry um, so that maybe it looks like your kitchen, but you could still use it as a desk space. Um, and then like the Hoosier, the kitchen is a very, very multi-purpose space. Uh, we do a lot of different things there, especially now with open concept. It's not just a place to cook. It's a place to entertain, a place to gather and talk, a, a place to have the kids do their homework while mom's cooking dinner. Um, and then you're not just doing one type of cooking in there. You could have your specialty cooking in the appliances. Um, you could have a baking space. You can have different zones, we call them now as kitchen designers. Um, and that's like the Hoosier cabinet was kind of a dedicated cabinet for that. Today, I've had clients ask for a cabinet similar to a Hoosier cabinet that has 
it goes down to the countertop and has maybe a garage, different shelves or little compartments that you can have it. Maybe it's a coffee or a coffee area or a bar or a baking zone. Um, and you can have it very dedicated and compartmentalized a lot like the Hoosier cabinet to have all those things in one spot. Um, and then I would say um, the open floor plan or some of the specialty appliances, even people want those to be multi-purpose or more versatile. I think the Instapot is kind of the quintessential multi-purpose appliance that is really popular right now. And I could see that growing in popularity or something similar to it coming out where you have that one appliance that can do multiple things really fast, <laughs> faster than your um, stove can do it. So those are the tr big trends that we see growing or coming down the line. Some really exciting upcoming trends. And um, I love watching these comments from all of you flow in. We'll get to those um, in just a minute, but it sounds like consumers across the country, mm. very similar. Um, a lot of uh, comments in here about things that designers are seeing. So just to give you a couple of takeaways, why does this matter? Yes, it's fun to dive into history. It's fun to jump into the data and the research on current consumers. And of course, it's really fun to look at what's next, but why does it matter and how do you use it in your business? So uh, just a couple of big takeaways here for you. Use search trends to uncover early shifts in consumer behavior. Um, so use that type of data you might find on Google Trends um, and, and what consumers are searching for to early uncover a need, figure out how to solve it and put a solution out there before your competitors have that or, um, you know, maybe there isn't anything on the market for it. You can also learn historical cycles to understand uh, the current, the present, and then also to predict what's next. So when we look through those, you know, couple hundred years of history in the kitchen, um, each one of those things that happened had an effect on what was next. So always be on the lookout for what's happening now and how is that affecting people and what is it going to make them want to do tomorrow? It's all about, um, you know, deciphering and predicting and forecasting. We don't have a crystal ball but we have a lot of context clues and we have what's happening today to help us figure out how we can be, you know, the best kitchen and bath designers tomorrow and into the future. So with that, we would love to take your questions and comments. Um, are you seeing these trends in your markets? Are there trends that you're seeing that we didn't hit? We'd love to talk about those too. Um, have you designed an Amazon room? We want to hear from you. <laughs> So I'm going to bring up the comments here and just read a few of the comments and some questions. Um, it looks like I don't have any just... in the Q&A box, but we do have the comments up. Hi, Christy, this is Deb. I just yes. wanted to thank all of you before we get started. So thanks, Christy, thank you, Janine, and thank you, Michelle, for this has been so interesting. And I just wanted to give Dimitru Doha from um, Headache just a chance to talk for a second. So Dimitru, if you're there, oh, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Hi, Debbie. Thank you. What a great presentation. It's uh, definitely a, a pleasure to sponsor. So I just wanted to remind everybody um, about our company. So we started, it's, uh, uh, we started in 1888 and uh, we started making cuckoo clocks and piano hinges. And uh, we grew to, to be one of the largest hardware manufacturers in the world. Uh, and we manufacture hardware for kitchen cabinets, uh, closets, residential furniture, and appliances. And um, one of the, our strong suit is quality. So you'll see, you'll see our uh, hardware in um, Sub-Zero, Thermador, and uh, also in a lot of kitchen cabinets, high-end kitchen cabinets. And um, again, I wanna thank you, Debbie. Definitely gr great presentation today. Well, thank you so much, Dimitri. And once again, I want to shout out to Headache for their generous sponsorship and to Felicitas, who I know is with us today as well, and, and to you as well, Dimitri. And ladies, we're ready to get those questions. If uh, Christy, if you would like me to help you, if you just want to scroll through, um, there was a question in the very beginning about the zero waste kitchen. So how would you like to handle this today? 
Sure. We've got them pulled up and we're all looking at them together. So um, we can just read through them and comment and get some feedback. Great. Um, there was a question from Angela on the zero waste kitchen slide. What is the row of silver discs under the bulk wall storage containers? Um, I believe that that was for spices. Yes. So um, that was kind of a uh, built-in spice organizer, bulk storage combined in one so that you could go to the grocery and purchase like grains or spices in bulk. And then that is your storage mechanism. So you or don't even bulk, need- Oh, the bulk, bulk food store. Yeah. There are yep. bulk mm -hmm. food stores. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. Local. Um, I love this. So uh, this must have been even before we showed the milk shoot slide. Um, there was a comment. It's the milk delivery box reinvented. Yes, very much. Uh, the Amazon room is that. Um, another comment from Stephanie, what about a delivery locker similar to what you see at Home Depot or at Whole Foods? So yes, this whole locker concept of being a place where you can accept purchases safely and it can be locked, but you don't have to be present. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what we're talking about. And I think that the consumers that are liking these lockers at Home Depot and Whole Foods are going to like it even better when it's in the convenience of their own home. So um, you know, this isn't necessarily giving the delivery service free access to your home, but it might be sort of like an outdoor closet or shed, almost like a Long mini space. garage or room yeah. that becomes that storage locker that can be locked or it can be temperature controlled. Um, another great uh, comment that came in from Laura, the Hoosier cabinet is similar to a larder cabinet. Yes, yes. exactly. exactly. Yeah. So that was actually another term for a generic term for that type of storage where you have it kind of all encompassing in one furniture piece. And we're actually seeing kind of um, a resurgence of that. We've seen manufacturers these days come out with larder cabinet type storage solutions or um, baking centers and things like that. Um, Lynn says she's working on designing a pantry incorporating the client's bulk item glass jars, attaching spe uh, specific size shelving on the pantry doors to accommodate these jars. Love that. That's a great solution. Um, you know, it feels like Everything that we buy at a store leads to more packaging and more recycling. So it's awesome to have um, the ability to store bulk items in glass jars. So there's a, um, from Stephanie, uh, she talks about buying a, an induction hot plate from mm -hmm. Ikea and pulling it out only when she needs it. Mm -hmm. um, what about a smaller appliance? So I just went from a 24 inch to an 18 inch dishwasher with a family of five because we, we moved. And uh, for us, I do a ton of cooking that is, you know, we use dishes often and all the time. So you just have to uh, be sure that, you know, it, if you're, it fits if for a smaller amount of people, you only would have to run it once a day, we have to run it usually about twice a day. Um, I would say, as in, to, in reference to trends on smaller appliances, um, I have not seen uh, many consumers requesting that. Um, I mean, I would think if you're into maybe zero waste or minimalism, maybe you would want to reduce the number of appliances or the size of appliances that you have. But in general, I would say consumers are asking for more or larger appliances, more I, like storage space. I would want my 24 inch dishwasher <laughs> is the point. Yes. Yeah, I have not seen a trend for smaller appliances at all, which is interesting. The multi-purpose is interesting though. You can pull it out when you need it and you can get rid of it when you need to as well. Um, I love this comment. This is from Laura. Laura said, I designed a delivery room, i.e. Amazon room for a client for packages and dry cleaning. Dry cleaning wow, is another, yeah, another great That's, use of that space. So awesome. yay, Laura, you are I'm super so <laughs> on the cutting edge of the trend. Yeah. Um, we'd love to see some of these pictures as well. Um, Gail has a really helpful tip um, when you're talking about the minimalism trend and having you know only the dishes that you need, maybe a, a place sitting of eight. Um, Gail says, you can also rent dishes and utensils if you're having a party. So you don't necessarily need to have um, place settings for the entire extended family for the once a year purpose, you could rent that or borrow that or um, figure out a way to um, have that only temporarily. 
Um, I wanted to respond to Doris's um, comment about uh, open shelving. Um, we, I do have a lot of clients that are concerned about having open shelving because of keeping them clean or keeping them looking nice or collecting grease and dust. So that is a great comment. When I recommend open shelving to people or people are interested or maybe afraid in open shelving, we do recommend that you use open shelving for items that are going to be used on a regular basis. So if they are used often, they don't tend to collect dust and grease. They're gonna get cleaned regularly that shelf will be empty sometimes and you can wipe it down. If you use the shelves for items that are just gonna sit there, if, like it's some shelving, you could maybe have a little bit for decorative items, but I wouldn't recommend that in a greasy or often used cooking space in the kitchen. You might want it at the end of an island or in a maybe a living space. So great, great comment, Doris, thank you. Um, Lynn has another great comment. If someone is truly a minimalist, then the idea of never ending storage is not an issue. Having a conversation about the stuff, driving the design is a difficult one. Does anyone really need three huge drawers of plastic Tupperware? Michelle, no. I'm sure that you no. know this. <laughs> I'm just gonna say right now, no, you don't. You don't need three drawers of plastic Tupperware. Um, people controlling their stuff is always a really kind of a touchy subject. I run across this all the time in, in my business where we just have to talk about downsizing, taking stuff down and um, practice putting your stuff away. You know, that is really an important, uh, an important thing. But yes, the stuff does drive the design. And many times we just have to be brutally honest mm -hmm. and say, you have too much stuff to put into this one <laughs> space. We have to think through this a little bit more. And I'd, I'd like to touch on that also. Um, I mean, I do with clients sometimes have to ask or gently, at, you know, do you plan on keeping everything? Are we going to be purging items? So you'd have to be careful about how you might address um, what they have and if they need four sets of silverware um, or anything like that. Um, I also, oh, I lost what I was going to say. What else I was going to say about that? There's a comment here I like from Gail. We just took out all those desks and kitchens. Exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You know, and I would say that like the desks that we took out that were designed in maybe the um, 90s flexible. to the early 2000s, that was more of a space to like drop your paper and like do yeah. the mail and like have sort of a paper center. Whereas a desk today or, um, you know, these multifunction spaces um, are more a space to set up a computer and maybe you have a monitor um, and maybe you have... You know, uh, Zoom meetings. Um, maybe you have a place for the kids to do, um, you know, art projects and school projects. So they need to function a little bit more than just that tiny little, maybe 30 inch space mm -hmm. that we used to have in those, those older desks. But it is funny, like as soon as something goes really out of style, it is um, ripe for rediscovery. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I thought of what I was say um in with having dedicated storage space for whether you're doing zero waste minimalism or just trying to be you know a well-organized person um if you were interested in zero waste or minimalism type lifestyles or organizing all of them all of the websites i looked at did say this is specific to the person and the family's lifestyle mm -hmm. so you have to determine what are you going to use all the time you have to determine how minimalist or how zero, you know, how strongly in that direction you want to go. And it's a gradual, constant adjustment process. So there's not like one definite way for everyone to be, um, mm -hmm. live in that type of mm -hmm. lifestyle. Well, these comments have been wonderful. It's so good to see the excitement from all of you about this topic. I mean, the, the three of us can nerd out about storage and organization forever. Um, but we really appreciate all the comments. I know that we are at the um, top of the hour at one o'clock. So um, with that, oops, well, I just want back to the picture. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. And thank you all to the audience. And thanks once again to Hedick for their generous sponsorship. Have a wonderful day, everyone.